We've been talking about the book of John, and what's framed the conversations we've been having is this, the power of Jesus to make us new. Anybody in the room been made new by the power of Jesus? We're, we're expressing energy around the fact that we know this. It's, it's something from the inside out. It's something that we could never earn, we could never deserve. It is the gift that we're talking about today, the gift of grace that came by way of Jesus' death and resurrection. John wrote his book some 60 years after Jesus had died and risen. However, he wrote it from an eyewitness perspective. John was there and walked with Jesus every day for three years. John was there when they crucified him. He's one of the only disciples that stayed all the way to the point of the crucifixion, even until they took Jesus from that cross. He was with Peter and among the first to go after Mary Magdalene had gone to the tomb on Sunday morning. She found it's empty, and she's like, what has happened to the body of Jesus? She runs back and tells Peter and John, and they take off running uh, to the tomb. And John writing, you know, he's not completely sanctified. He wants you to know that he did beat Peter running to the tomb. But he doesn't name himself. He just says, and that other person. But when they get to the tomb, Peter is the one who never stops. He just keeps going right inside. John stops. And then John goes in and they find the grave clothes. And then that night, Sunday night at the resurrection, the disciples are gathered in a room and there's a lot of fear, uncertainty, hesitation because Perhaps they would be next to be hunted down by Rome and be crucified. And into the room steps the resurrected Christ. He doesn't use the door. He just steps in in his supernatural power. And he shows them the wounds in his hands and his side. But he's got this, this glorified, re-engineered body. And he tells them not to fear. And he begins to lead them. And he's going to even perform more signs before his Ascension, And so John saw all of that. So when I, when I start talking to you from the book of John, I want you to know we are hearing the words of someone who was there. So this is not a fable. This is not some made-up tradition by a group of people. This is from an eyewitness account of a historical event. John was there, and he's going to write about it. And his book, scholars say, that it has a divine symmetry because he builds the entire book around the number seven. So John writes and tells us about Jesus giving the seven I am statements representing his character and nature. Where he said, I am the bread of life, the light of the world. I'm the door, shepherd, the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, truth, and the life. And I'm the true vine. We as believers become the branches. Our power, our productivity is all because of the power that's coming from the vine into the branch. Then he gave us seven signs. Other gospel writers call these miracles. John chose to call them signs. There's a reason. The signs are turning water into wine. The nobleman's son that was raised to life. The man at the pool of Bethesda that was healed the feeding of the 5,000, the blind man who had his sight restored, Lazarus who was raised to life, and then Jesus in his own resurrection. They say that John used this literary device in giving us these seven signs because the first and the seventh carry the same movement, the same message, the second and the sixth, and so on until you get to the centerpiece, the feeding of the 5,000. When Jesus turned the water into wine and then he rose from the dead, the first and the seventh, you see transformation. Something that becomes something that it wasn't. Something that is converted only because of supernatural power. The second and the sixth, the nobleman's son and Lazarus, both raised from death to life. So the movement is the power of God to cause someone's heart that had stopped to start beating again. And they're resurrected back to life. The man at the pool and the blind man that expresses the power of Jesus to bring healing. Then the feeding of the 5,000. It's in the middle 
Because that's the one where the son gave all that he had. Now, up against so many, how could a sack lunch feed a multitude? Like, how could a sack lunch feed the people in this room, much less 20,000? But see, when the blessing of God rests on the son's total sacrifice, then the multitude are fed with 12 baskets left over. And when you look at the comprehensive power of Jesus through the signs, what is represented by who he is from door, shepherd, light, and resurrection, you then understand how he can make us new. And so he gives us seven conversations. And he made Nathaniel new. Nathaniel was a skeptic. He didn't believe this stuff. He didn't think anything good could come from Nazareth. He had his skepticism. But when he encountered Jesus and Jesus encountered him, he was totally changed. Then you have Nicodemus, who's this religious expert. He could dot every I, cross every T religiously, but his heart was empty. But when he encountered Jesus, he learned about being born again, being born of the Spirit. And he is one of the few people, when Jesus dies on the cross, it's Nicodemus who's taking him from the cross and taking him to that borrowed tomb. And that was a huge risk for Nicodemus. But when you've been born again, you've thrown off restraint and you are just living in the power of that newness. And then there's the woman of Samaria who understood what it was like take the living water a life so broken and just in a cycle of doom and defeat but but an encounter with Jesus and she's made new the man at the pool of the Bethesda could be made well the woman caught in the act of adultery could be forgiven and have a future the blind man or Lazarus could be raised to life think about this he'd been dead four days and there's such power in Jesus that his brain starts firing. His heart starts beating again and blood starts flowing through his veins. And he walks out of that tomb at the power of a resurrection word, Lazarus. The man born blind had his sight restored. And so John compiles this this book, as an eyewitness, he watched Jesus say these things about himself and then watched him live it out. He watched Jesus perform these signs and then hold these conversations and change so many people. And so he, he culminates his letter by saying, but these are written, John 20, 31, that you may believe. I want you to believe today. I don't want you to have any doubt that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God. And watch this, by believing, you may have life. Life. Now, now you get it. We're not just talking about our physical heart beating. We're talking about a dimension. We're talking about a, 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 an experience, a relationship that Jesus is inviting us into where we realize why we are here where we realize that, that we were created by God for God. We have identity, we have purpose, we have future through the marvelous grace of God. We understand that through all of this, John would tell us we are a resurrection-focused people. That's why we're here today. But you say, I, Ron, my struggle is believing like it's, it's fascinating how the book is put together. It's fascinating what you say. And I, I see these names and I see these signs and I see these conversations, but I just struggle. Like, can we believe the veracity of the Bible? Because if we can't, then those are just conversations. Those are, those are just stories. And this is really just a tradition along with Easter eggs. But I want to submit to you today that there is more evidence for this book than any other book. And I don't want to just say that. I want to tell you, you could take the, the top 100 works of all history that document history. The way they are authenticated is you, you look at how many volumes you have from the original. So how many copies? 
It creates the volume from the original. Then critics take it and test the purity of the text, textual purity, continuity, the same message, so that you come to a place of a percentage of textual purity, and with volume and purity, they say you can trust it. And of the most authenticated works that we have of history, there may be upwards of 850 copies of the original that carry forth the same message that have a very high percentage so that if you are reading those words and those works, you can trust them. But when it comes to the New Testament, just the New Testament, there are 5,800 copies of the original. And when the critics got a hold of those copies and did their research. These are people that had no bias. They were unbelievers. If any, they would, they would be looking for a bias toward error and just a, just a fable. But they came to the conclusion, listen to this, it's got 99.5% purity. So I just want to stand in front of all of you and tell you I'm so happy you're here and I'm preaching from a Bible but that I've literally... I've given my life to the person that this Bible is about. I believe it with all of my heart. My wife are, and I are wonderfully blessed, and it's all because of Jesus. It's all because of the promises of this word, and it is an absolute honor to talk to you, not from a fable, but from a foundation that is good, that is worthy. And, and I want you to experience his presence today. In 1935, a man had gained an incredible library of papyri from Egypt. And he knew that there was something unique about these. And he, he invited an expert to review them. And this expert came across one of them, the size of a credit card. I'll show it to you. And this expert said, this one's unique. And they sent it off to the papyri experts of the world, about five of them, asking, can you date it and tell us what is on it? It had writing on the front and the back. And sending it back to them, they dated it as 8090. That would have been at the precise time that John wrote the letter we're looking into today. And on that papyri, the size of a credit card, is John 18, where Jesus is going before Pilate and then ultimately to the cross. That's John 18. And then you get into John 19, and that's where John, an eyewitness of Jesus dying on the cross, is an eyewitness of the empty tomb, and that night, an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. And God would have it that there is preserved in a library in Manchester, England, to this day, something that dates back to the original. And so writing this letter, John wrote in chapter 14, that because he lives, you can live. And I want you to know he lives, and it's authenticated, and it's validated. There's a veracity. Come on. This is good ground. So I'm not inviting you into just some church story today. I'm inviting you into truth. And anybody that has an interest in doing the historical research, at some point, you move from it being historical, and it becomes personal. It becomes more than information because this is not just uh, data. This is a person. Truth is not just information. It's a person. And it moves from being historically accurate to being personally life-changing because he is the truth. He is the way. He is the life. And a relationship with him makes you new. Put some praise right there. God can make you new today. And, and I'm reaching from the front row to the middle to the back, from side to side. I want you to know how much Jesus loves you. And I want you to know that he's real and he wants to do something so personal that the only way you would describe it is to be able to say, I've been made new. I want to show you how personal it gets in one of these conversations. And I'll give you the backstory. In John chapter 8, these Pharisees, these religious people, not saved at all, 
they want to trap Jesus because they don't like him. They don't like his, his presence. They don't like his message. So they actually catch a woman in the act of adultery, throw her at the feet of Jesus, and as was their custom, he's going to have to support their opportunity to murder her. They're holding the rocks and they're going to stone her. And so he breaks that trap with authenticity. And you know this story, if you've been around at all, about what he says. He says, who is without sin? Let him cast the first stone. Remember that? And that's where we pick up the story. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left. There he was with this woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and he asked her, listen to this question. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Like all of these people were lined up in total condemnation of her. Accusation and condemnation ready to murder her. And then Jesus steps in, draws a line in the sand. Says, whoever's without sin cast. And one by one until no one is left but Jesus and this lady. And captured in this story is just how personal and powerful grace is. In this story is why Jesus would go to the cross and suffer like he did and rise triumphantly. Here Jesus is with this lady and he says, where are they? Where are they? Because he's wanting her to identify the moment when grace starts working, condemnation gets removed. Now, these were actual people, but for us, and I know in my own life, more than people, it's been voices in my own mind, voices of accusation and voices of condemnation. Maybe you're in that place today, and maybe some of those voices, they're old. They've been a part of your life for years, condemning you over something that happened, something that you did. Some of the voices may be new, as new as something that happened last night. And you will know that Jesus is working in his grace in your life when those voices start being silenced one after the other because the power of grace is to create a condemnation-free zone. Now, it's not because she was innocent and falsely accused. She's guilty. And if Jesus ever wanted the opportunity to condemn somebody, he has his opportunity. But notice, he follows through in the very essence of his, his coming to us, and that is God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that this lady and us through him might be saved. The disciples are watching this. John is an eyewitness, and and John is watching Jesus look beyond brokenness, look beyond her sin and beyond her guilt, and get rid of the condemnation and offer her a future. Let me tell you what grace does. Grace thinks differently than we do. Jesus thinks differently than we do. That, That lady had to be there going, I'm done. I'm done. I'm guilty. She's not expecting Jesus to have mercy. And yet what she experiences is what we all have to see, and that is grace doesn't ignore the past, but it forgives the past. Grace doesn't condemn. Grace forgives. See, here's the way you know grace is working. Jesus always sees a future. Jesus always sees your potential of changing and he never, ever lets the conversation stop with condemnation. That's grace. Then he says to her, now go, the word go in the Greek means take a step, step into this, step into this new life, step into this forgiveness. 35 years as a pastor, on a short list that I see things that hold people back is that they, they, 
They just don't fully grasp the power of forgiveness. We're in this earn it, deserve it culture. But grace is something you can't earn and you can't deserve it. We're wretched, we're sinful, we're guilty. And here Jesus finds her at perhaps her worst moment. And he doesn't ignore that it's her worst moment, but he forgives her and sets her up for her future. And he says, now go and sin no more. And how does a person really change? A person changes through this power of grace. The greatest power to live right is that you are right. When you get saved, you are made right. When you get saved, you are put right. When you get saved, you stand in the righteousness of God. And to understand that, to internalize that, is to experience the power to live right. I want you to think about what Jesus said on the cross. He said, Father, and I'll put that in front of you, and then he said, forgive them. And then John records in chapter 19, that last statement of Jesus on the cross, it is finished. I want you to know today that you have a father. All of us as parents or grandparents, we know that, that no matter what our kids do, we love them. End of story. They carry our DNA. And we, and, and we may have confusion over some things they do, or we may be heartbroken over some things they do, but there is never a day where we don't love them. They are ours. They bear our image. They carry our DNA. Do you realize that when Jesus is with this lady, he's with his daughter. She bears his image. She carries his DNA. And he's not in approval of her lifestyle, but he's not condemning, he is loving. And I want you to get this today. The Bible says if, if we're like that as parents and we're earthly, then how much more loving is our heavenly father? I'll tell you, he loves unconditionally. Grace is not that we deserve or could ever earn it. Grace comes from the unconditional love of our heavenly Father. Our heavenly Father who forgives. And when he said, Father, forgive them, and he paid the price and said, it is finished, then we know it was done. Like forgiven. Forgiven completely, yes? Meaning debt paid in full. How many of you like Kelly and I you own a home, but the bank does too. <laughs> and maybe someday we can all make that final payment and we get a deed paid in full. When Jesus said, it is finished, paid in full. He's not going to have to route back and pay it again. Finished, final. In that day, if someone was indicted with a list of crimes, found guilty, that indictment was like a list that, that was there posted where they were incarcerated. But when they got out, having paid their time, it was, it was stamped to telestai, paid in full. And these are the words that everybody there, knowing that culture, would, would be understanding. He's saying that sin is paid in full and prisoners can go free. Prisoners of sin, prison to our human nature, prison to our fallen nature, but because of what Jesus did, on the cross, he paid it in full. The debt is paid. The door opens. He is the door. He's the shepherd that leads us through that door. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He raises us from spiritual death, and we're made new. And he has that incredible power to not only forgive, but to forget. He doesn't hold it against you. You've heard this language before that at the cross, what Jesus did, it was complete. Meaning he's not going to have to die again because it was paid in full. 
So then I want this perhaps, need, if this jars you, let, let it work with this. If this creates tension, let it, but process it through the word of God. That means he died for every sin, past, present, and future. If that's not true, then we're going to need another crucifixion. And remember, in the Old Testament, there was one sacrifice offered after another because those sacrifices were never perfect, so therefore they could never be complete. But all of it was pointing to Jesus, where in Jesus there would be perfection and there would be completion. And so once and for all, he mounted the cross as the final sacrifice and he rose triumphant over sin, over Satan, over death, over the grave, gives us salvation, purpose, and a full eternity. Come on, the cross and the resurrection, it is finished. You are, what if you woke up every day saying, I have a father and I'm forgiven? And he forgets it. One thing, I so appreciate my parents for a million reasons, but when they would discipline us as kids, and, and, and they did spanking in my house. We didn't, we didn't, only time out we knew was in basketball. And so we get out and we get a spanking, but once it, once it was done, it was done. Like, they didn't bring it back up a week later, two weeks later. I was just a kid, and at my school, there was this multicolor wire, and you could weave them and make rings and bracelets, and you, I started a business. And I did. I was an entrepreneur. I had a shoebox. It was filled, and a friend of mine said, there is like this phone box, phone, P-H-O-N-E. Uh, we used to use this to talk. Um, and so my friend said, underneath that box, there's a harvest. I resonated with that. As a Christian, I knew about the word harvest. There's a harvest of wire, blue, yellow, red. And I said, let's get in. I got my mama's uh, scissors, and I took them down there, and I just started cutting. I got shocked three times, but I got 15 boxes of multicolored wire. And business went to another level. And it did. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. And one morning, I woke up, and my dad said, hey, let's go to the donut shop, which was almost a daily occurrence. And I praise the Lord for that. And we turned the corner to go up from Kasachi up Tomahawk, and there was the phone box, the Southwestern Bell truck, and the police. My dad said, where have you been getting that wire? I said, not there. <laughs> In my heart, I was like, and so uh, I confessed, and my dad had to go before that, the board of the phone and pay a fine. I, I knocked out 700 homes from their phone service. I'm your pastor. It's great to know you. You'll be looking for another church. If your phone's not working, it's not me. I learned my lesson. So, <laughs> and I got to tell you, because I'm raised, you know, Parents, Christian, grandparents, my mamma said, Ronnie, you will tithe on what you've made. So I did pay tithe on it. I want you to know I paid tithe on what I made. I advanced the kingdom. It's not all lost. But I mean, that was a major thing. It was one of the worst things I did as a kid. And uh, I got in trouble. I still remember that. And, but it was over. See, Jesus, he forgives and he forgets. Isn't that amazing? I just came back in the country from a trip, and I had to use my passport at immigration, and they scanned it, and they were looking for certain data in order to let me in. If you and I went to heaven today and there is a spiritual passport, the data from that passport has to say you are sinless. Or you don't get in because no sin can enter heaven. So then how do we enter? We know ourselves because he became sin. Let this bless you today. That we might become the righteousness of God. He became that we might become. So here in a couple of weeks when they have the Masters Golf Tournament, somebody will win the green jacket and a gazillion dollars. And they will have a dinner with all the past champions who are still alive. And if they can, they'll wear their green jacket. 
And no matter what happens in history, nobody can ever take, no matter what happens in the future, nobody can take away the fact that they are winners and they have the jacket. If you open your heart to Jesus, grace will silence the condemnation. Grace will forgive your sins. You have a father with unconditional love who will forgive you. John wrote it like this in his first letter, first, second, and third John. First John, he said, if you are willing to confess your sins, he's willing and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. He became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. So you are literally robed in righteousness. His victory becomes your victory. His winning becomes your winning. His death and resurrection, you died and rose again as well. And so you have imputed to you the righteousness of Jesus so that when God sees you, he sees you through the sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus. So you're the sons and the daughters of God. Welcome home. Wow. Now that power, that power, knowing that kind of grace becomes the empowerment to live it out. To be sanctified in progression, to, to be transformed, to live as a disciple, to live in the freedom that you long for. So I just want to put this in front of you today. Don't believe more in your sin than the sinless blood of Jesus. Worship team, if you'll come today. Here's the next one. Your bad life cannot undo, hear it, undo what Jesus did on the cross. And perhaps you've heard a pastor say this. We are now, because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we are not fighting for victory, are we? He's won the victory. We're fighting from victory. Fighting because this isn't easy. We're still becoming. We, we're saved, but we're being transformed. We're tempted. We're challenged. We are confronted by the enemy and with adversity. So we're fighting, but it's, it, we're not fighting to win. We've already won. Oh, get that today. We've already won. You are forgiven. And therein is the power to live right, to live free, to live differently, to live set apart. This isn't a license to sin. Anybody that really gets this knows this isn't a license to sin. You are so overwhelmed by grace. You want to, in that fresh motivation, say, I'm going to honor God. But he empowers you to honor. Honor him. Nothing compares. The tomb is empty. Your heart can be full. Jesus knelt down, drew a line in the sand, that lady and her brokenness. Then he stands up and he says, where are they? He wants her to identify the moment. Identify the moment. Grace causes you to say, wait a minute. Because of him, there's no condemnation. I'm guilty, but I'm not condemned because of grace. Then you accept that grace and it says, go, that's take a step. It's like that line in the sand, like step over that line into the power of real forgiveness. Experience it. She's experiencing that level of forgiveness. And then he says, it's a new day. Quit living like you're living. Now you have the power. The power that has made you right is the power for you to live right. Go. Thank you for ushering. I, I, I saw Boz Cannon. Boz, are you in the room? If you didn't, just lift a hand. He's back with kids. Boz and Lindsay were sitting just behind Kelly and me 12 years ago. And when I gave the opportunity I'm about to give, their hands went up. They accepted Jesus as their savior. And for 12 years, they've been following Jesus. They now have two beautiful kids, beautiful family. And on that day, this day, Easter Sunday, 12 years ago, they said yes. And I, I didn't do this in any other service. This is probably gonna throw the whole live stream off, but 
we'll figure it out. Imagine if this was like an imaginary line at each one of these aisles. And that today you say, I'm not really living in the power of forgiveness. And that here in a moment you just get out and physically walk down and a physical action would represent a spiritual truth that's happening in your life. And like identify the moment, no condemnation, receive his forgiveness and you step, you step across that line. You step across the line. We call it a line of faith. That's where you put your faith in His grace. And you step into the power of forgiveness. You step into grace. You step into newness. You step into freedom. You step in to what God has for you. It's a gift. You just step into it with your faith. You open up this gift. And you'll find yourself 12 years from now like Boz and Lindsay saying, we're so blessed. I want you to stand with me, everybody. With your eyes closed, if you say, Pastor, you, you just spoke in this word of grace and it's for me. It's for me. Here in a moment, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand. You say, what does that mean? That means I know who I'm praying with and who I'm praying for. So if you'd say, I need His grace. I need the power of forgiveness. I need this guilt, this shame to be broken off of me. I need the power of the love of Jesus in my life. If that is you, would you just raise your hand right now as quickly as you can? All right, keep them up. One, two, three, four, five. Keep lifting them. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I think we can do better. 13 people are going to step. 13 people are about to step into the power of grace. I'm going to ask this team to sing here in just a moment. And those of you who lifted your hand, I want you to do that physical action. I'm going to ask you to come just step across, just step into this. But here's what we're going to do. I want you to turn to that friend that's with you today and just say, hey, if that message was for you, you'd like to go pray for God's grace I'll go with you because every Christian they've answered an altar call like this in their life and they know the life changing sacred moment that is about to happen so just start asking and the minute they say yes that's me I want you to step out and start coming as we sing today